Good afternoon. I almost said good evening. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back to From Sickness to Health. I hope you are finding the information that Rico was sharing beneficial. You've been uh, diligently taking notes and um, are going to be able to begin to apply some of these health principles that you have been learning about. Um, so as a reminder, beginning next Sunday at 6 p.m., we will be tackling a 10-week project moving you from sickness to health with this book. It's called Healthy Self. And uh, it's going to go through each one of these principles, these 10 health principles. And we are going to be doing it here live. Uh, if we have people that are still um, during the COVID not wanting to come out, we will be providing a, a live stream. But if it po at all possible, you at home, come. It's better to be part of a group for support and encouragement and accountability. If you're at home, you're, it's hard to be accountable to anybody. When you're in a group, you're accountable to your group. And so we have a great time. We walk through this book night by night, one night a week for 10 weeks. It's not 10 solid weeks, so it's not overwhelming, right? Those that have come through it before have found it very beneficial. So again, if you are online, go to our Facebook group, facebook.com, Tacoma Central Outreach. Inside there, you'll find the group. If you are, uh, we're going to be streaming it through the From Sickness to Health group, just as you're watching this program live. And so, again, email. Send us an email. Let us know if you want to go. I have about 10 people that are signed up so far. I'm looking for more because I know there's more of you out there on the Internet that want to move from sickness to health and become a healthy self. So... Thank you for coming. We appreciate. We're sad that Rico is going to be leaving us, um, but we have very much appreciated his time here. How many people have enjoyed all the sample foods? I want to give a big thank you to Linda Heath. She's probably not going to stand up, but she's the one sitting in the back row. You can see her smiling and waving. She's the one that's preparing all the food for us each night. So a big thank you to Linda for her dedication in working. So are you ready to get into it? You got your papers out, your pens out? Ready to take some notes? Rico, did you change it, your topic? Is it not read between the labels? Is it like kale and collards, a love story? No, it's read between the labels. Okay, but we're gonna talk about a love story in there. All right, read between the labels. All right, thank you. Testing. I think you have to turn it. Can you hear me? Am I on? Is this thing on? Good afternoon, everyone. How's everyone doing today? Are you excited about life? Oh, I am so excited. When I, by the time I get to Sunday, I am so excited about this topic because of the things that I have discovered. And some of you who have been coming, you've been through quite a few of my lectures. Yeah? You've seen... Uh, the From Sickness to Health, and apparently you, you, you have found something, you've gleaned something that has been helpful to you, and that's why you keep coming back. But I want you to know, for those who, who sit through uh, even the lectures you've seen before, uh, and you, you kind of just, you know, just kind of work through it, you know, saying, yeah, I've seen that, I heard that, yeah, I get it, I know. But you're going to get a treat today because I'm gonna share some things that I've not shared before. Now, some of it will be similar and familiar to you, but there are other aspects of it that I have just learned in the last couple years, and um, I'm excited to share it with you today. So, with that said, let's get right into our topic today. It's read between the labels, read between the labels, which is kind of counterintuitive, but there are basic things that you should know. If you're going to read labels, you know, you have, you have whole foods and you have food products. You have whole foods 
and you, you have food products. Can, can you just say that with me? You have whole foods, and then you have food products. Now, products need labels, yeah? Um, you need labels on them, but whole foods, like that tomato you see there, it doesn't need a label, does it? No, it doesn't need a label. It just is packed with goodness, produced, manufactured, manufactured by the hands of a loving, loving God, as I like to say. Now, I'm going to go, wait a minute. Hold on, work with me for a second here. There we go. All right, so let's just give you some basics about reading labels. All right, some basics. Number one, what's the first thing that you should read when you're looking at a label? Now, l mind you, we should be doing more whole foods where you don't need to read a label. You understand, right? When you make that big colorful salad and it's got, it's got some kale in it, like put kale in my salad. I like to put some yellow and some orange peppers in my salad, some cucumbers, some celery, right? And then I actually put, now as I mentioned, I didn't used to like tomatoes, but now tomatoes, cherry tomatoes in my salad, right? I like, um, I like some purple in my salad, so I, I use purple cabbage, right? So you do the colors of the rainbow, and as I'm working and putting all these different ingredients in there, uh, I've had to read about none of its content or ingredients, right? It's just been nothing but natural goodness, right? So lots of colors, but when you do a food product that has, that's in a box, or in a bag, or in a can, what's the first thing you want to read? This is just the basics. The ingredients give a prize to the lady over here. Yes, it's the ingredients first. And you really want to pay attention to the first how many ingredients in the ingredients list of things. The first three. And if sugar is one, two, or three, what do you do? You put it back because that's a dessert. That's not a food problem. So even when you've got that beautiful salad of all the colors of the rainbow and then you reach for a salad dressing and sugar is either one, two, or three in that list of ingredients, you don't want that because your salad just became a dessert, whether you like it or not, right? Personally, I prefer to make my own salad dressing. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, like, I make my own salad dressing and I just use lemon juice, right? That's God's natural vinegar, right? Lemon juice. I squeeze a bunch of lemons, I add some herbs, I drop in some fresh garlic, just a tad bit of extra virgin olive oil. I shake and I've got my salad dressing and you know what? I don't have to worry about it because even with that lemon juice, I'm doing more than just making my salad taste good. I'm also detoxing my liver because lemon juice is a natural liver detoxer. Write that down. You want to record that because if you're ever taking any kind of medications, you want to constantly be putting lemon juice in your body because it detoxes the liver. It does it naturally. So that's what I like to do. Now, so. First three ingredients, if one of them is sugar, that's not what you're going to have. And some people are having desserts every single day, and then they wonder, why do I keep gaining weight? Well, there you go. You're having, because what happens to sugar in the body is just converted to fat. And the fat you eat is the fat you wear. And you don't want to do that. Then you want to just kind of look at how many servings, how many calories per serving. And you have to pay attention to the serving size. A lot of times you look at it and you're like, okay, that per that amount of servings, okay, that's fine. But you have to really pay attention to the serving. Now, one thing I want to focus your attention to and kind of almost go back thinking about what we talked about on yesterday, which was the amount of fiber in the diet, right? You want to look at how many, uh, what percentage of fiber is in that dish per serving. It should be at least 25% of the total amount of the serving or calories should be fiber, right? So you want to look at that as well. But again, this, this talk is really not about how to get you down into the details of reading labels. 
we want to move beyond that and we want to start to make things ourselves and then you don't even have to worry about it. Like, for example, I got to say, I've had the garbanzo bean patties many places. It's the recipe that I provide for this lecture. But I got to say, Linda, you, get the un you understand knocking something out of the park? Home run? Yeah, you did it. Yes, did you have those gar garbanzo bean patties? Anybody have them? Oh, see there? You'll just have to sign up for the 10 weeks because I know they'll be shared again in the 10 week program. They were excellent. So again, thank you, Linda, for just amazing. And the granola was excellent, most excellent as well last night. And both of them had lots of fiber in them, right? And because she made those patties from raw ingredients, right? You're not worried about what's in this. Well, you might if you have a problem with coconut, which I believe the young lady over here has an issue with that, um, or coconut oil, those kind of things. But that's just an individual thing based on what restrictions you have. But the point is, is that when we make our own food, our own patties, in other words, you can make your own garbanzo bean patties, or you can go to the store and you can buy some kind of patty that's in a box. And then you got to start reading stuff. And then when you get down into that list of ingredients and you just start to go through th things that you cannot pronounce, right? If you can't pronounce it, it's probably an additive to give life or shelf life to it or some type of flavoring to change the taste or enhance the taste both of which are not good for you. Make sense? Now, let's press on. Now, there have been lots of diets. What I share with you is not a diet. From night one, from day one, as we got started, we talked about lifestyle. In fact, we started with lifestyle habits of the longest living Americans, those who live the longest they have a lifestyle. That means that they are doing things intentionally that improves their health, but also extends their life and gives them quality of life, right? And we looked at those principles, not stressing out about things, right? We talked about having refreshing rest, getting enough sleep, getting out in the sunshine when it's available, good nutrition, exercise, water, being temperate, and also getting out in the open air as much as you possibly can. And then there are a couple other principles there that I will leave for Mark to really walk you through. But today I'm talking about nutrition and nutrition really does tell very well with what we talked about last night. Uh, the key takeaways there were, you know, high fiber, rich foods, right? You remember that? We talked about with every meal, there should be a corresponding movement. I know you were thinking it. A movement should, be a, should accompany that. And we talked about foods that don't have fiber last night. We talked about how meat and eggs and cheese, they don't have fiber. Therefore, they, per, they, they kind of enter your system and behave like a house guest that doesn't know when to leave, right? But everything should function like trains that come into a station. And when the next train comes, it leaves the station very simple illustration to make sure that you're tracking what I'm saying. So the things that I'm talking about today are not diet type foods or a diet program. We should just completely disabuse our minds of this concept of diet and begin to think more about what is the lifestyle that I want to have. But let me give you some notable diets in history. First of all, there's the keto diet. The keto diet is very popular right now. Have you heard about the keto diet? There are people, and it amazes me. I was looking for something in the store the other day, and um, they had a whole shelf that was just for keto, K-E-T-O. And I thought, wow, what a marketing sham, right? Because do you know what a keto diet is? It's basically, no matter how they try to spin it, it's just the idea that you would use as the primary source of 
fuel for the body, it would be fat. That's what it is. And that is terrible. It's a terrible idea, right? Now, what will it do? Well, if the objective is to lose weight, guess what? You'll lose weight. You will. It's like so many of the other diets. They have as an objective to lose weight. Listen to me, friends. Your objective never should be to lose weight. That is the worst thing you could do because you become obsessed with this idea of always doing things that's based on, predicated on, the results being losing weight, and then when you don't, you give up. If you don't do it fast enough, you give up. Any of those things cause people to give up, and the key is to be gradual, to be steadfast, to take your time, and then allow what takes place through a lifestyle program, which, by the way, plugging again, what Mark is gonna be starting just in a, in a week, right? is going to be a lifestyle program, not a diet. But this whole idea, look at some of the books that have been written. If you Google, search, you will find keto is the number one diet that you'll find if you actually go and Google it. That's the number one thing you'll see. And I looked at some of these books, Bacon and Butter, the ketogenic diet. Look at that stack of bacon, right? So basically what they're saying to you is eat all the fat and oil you want because one thing's going to happen, you're going to lose weight. Now you'll get cancer along with that eventually, with that bacon, but it will cause you to lose weight. So since 2018, that's been like the number one search thing. Now people are starting to wake up to the idea of a vegan vegetarian diet because you know what, they're popping up all over the place and all of the evidence, the, the evidence-based research is convincing that that's the best thing. Also here, we see that the paleo, that's also something that comes up on Google. Paleo answer, keto diet and paleo, but this one caught my attention. Cave women don't get fat. <laughs> See, the whole thing is, is that it's all about hunter and gatherer, and you go out and you get yourself um, some type of animal that they tried to run away from you, by the way, uh, but you caught it, killed it, and then all the fat and everything else along with it, you ate it, and you know what? Because of that, it was a keto or paleo diet, and back in the, going back to the caveman days, and I guess somehow somebody has surmised or concluded that the cave women didn't get fat back then as a result. So they wrote a book. I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's mostly tongue in cheek, but nonetheless. Paleo diet for athletes, right? So all these things are types of diets that they're pushing. Continuing on on notable diets in history, 2007 to present, good calories, bad calories, counting calories. Anybody like to do that? That's what that book's about. Why we get fat and what to do about it. All these books. I mean, if you go into the section where these types of books are, and this guy has really made a lot of money from dealing with calories and watching the weight. Look at that middle book, Why We Get Fat, that measuring uh, tape to just always be focused on losing weight, right? I tell you, friends, the best way you can ever, if you really just want to lose weight and you have meat in your diet, take it out. Take it out, walk every day, 30 minutes to an hour, you'll drop pounds. It's that simple. What you eat, keep it low calories, and if you do it on a plant-based diet, it's going to be low calories unless you're eating Oreos, because Oreos are vegan, right? And then get some, <laughs> get some cakes and cookies and pies, which can be vegan, right? But they still have sugar. And sugar is sugar is sugar is sugar, right? No matter how you slice it. He even wrote a book called The Diet Delusion. Then 2003, also notable in history, the South Beach Diet. If you partake of this particular diet, you'll look like the people at South Beach. You know what South Beach is? That's in Miami, Florida where everyone spends time on the beach and they have on skimpy clothes because they're all skinny and you can look just like them. 
It's a sham. It's a scam. I'm telling you, don't buy into it. But you know what? It was popular for a while, right? Then 1978, the Scarsdale, the Scarsdale diet, right? This diet, they're all kind of the same thing. They're heavy meat or fat or things like that. And we learn very quickly that if you do a lot of fat, if you do a lot of protein, a lot of meat, it actually revs up the metabolism because the body has to break that stuff down. I like what someone says. Usually people say you are what you eat, but really the, the real truth is you are what you metabolize. So if you eat high protein, fatty foods, saturated fat, revs up that metabolism, and if you're just doing a lot of it, like I was going through the grocery line one time in Trader Joe's, and I had a bunch, you know, I had my colorful vegetables and things like that, and the cashier decided to just engage me that day very, in a very confrontational way. She said, oh, I see you have a lot of vegetables. I was like, oh, yeah. She says, well, you know, I don't really do carbs anymore. I just do meat. I said, really, that's kind of like the Atkins diet? She said, yeah, yeah, carbs are bad, all types of carbs. I took them all out of my diet. And I just, I just, I lost weight very quickly. I said, well, I said, you know what? You should do a little more research and find out what happened to the people who came up with those diets. She didn't like when I said that. And she rushed me out of her line. <laughs> 1975, there was the Stone Age diet. See, it always keeps going back to the Stone Age for some reason. Trying to get you to go back to the past. Notice how it keeps going back further and further. Cave women, Stone Age. This was a book. This was a book. And in this book, it's all about going out, hunter and gathering. Now, the foraging part, I can deal with where they were going and, and pulling up nice greens and tubers and things like that. But it's mainly focusing on going out with a bow and arrow and taking down some big animal, right? And feasting upon its flesh. Dr. Dr. Atkins, diet revolution in 1972. But this wasn't even the, 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 the original or the original time that he came out with it. It was even earlier than that, but the original, this was the original low-carb craze that took place, and Dr. Atkins, they realized, well, yes, his method of dieting works. You lose weight again. That's the objective. That's the goal for a lot of people. Just lose some weight, but you destroy and overtax the kidneys in the process, and, or you get heart disease before that, and... Do you know how Dr. Atkins died? Heart disease. Now, you see the title there? The Drinking Man's Diet. <laughs> you think I'm joking, don't you? I'm not joking, it's a book. The Drinking Man's Diet. In other words, you can drink the weight off. All you need is just some wine and spirits, some beer, and you can actually, I don't know what that's coming from, but when I saw it, I said, I just got to put that in just for, just for effect. But what about this diet? Anybody know about the original diet? The original diet is actually found in Genesis chapter 129. Now, I've been doing this, um, I've been participating along with um, some really heavy hitters, uh, T. Colin Campbell, uh, Dr. Hannah uh, Kaliova, who is the with res, uh, responsible physicians, we've been doing for the last three years uh, this thing called a plant-based summit, and it's uh, been held in New York over the last few years, and um, it's been a great joy to be a part of it. And what they asked me to do, because they know that I both am passionate about health, but also passionate about the Bible. Um, they wanted me to present on the original diet, or what is the diet from the Bible. And what was fascinating to me, they had, like I said, they had a lot of great scientists there who were presenting. And as they were presenting all this information about a plant-based diet, because that's what it was all about. But none of them knew about the origin of a plant-based diet. So when I stood up, and it was my turn to present, and I took them back, 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 beyond all of these diets that they've heard about, 
through Atkins and Scarsdale and South Beach and you know all of that foolishness, but also as they looked at some of the recent science and research on a plant-based diet, certainly from the China study from T. Colin Campbell and others, Dr. Furman, as you know, some of the uh, authors of the books that have been given out, they did not know that it went back even further than that. So I presented on Genesis 129 where God says, I have given you fruits, nuts, grains, and seeds. This shall be your diet. This shall be your food. In other words, God was saying, I made man. I know what's best for man. And this is the fuel that the body needs. I'll get more into that in just a few moments. And then some bad things happened. There was what they said was a fall or sin. And man chose to go a different route. In fact, it was the decision to eat a different diet than what God said eat. And it propelled the whole world into chaos. But then God did something. He then introduced something else to the diet. Again, recall, the original diet was fruit. What else was it? Nuts. What else? Grains and seeds. Yes. But greens, collard greens, you know, your different uh, root, roots and leafy greens and tubers, those were not a part of the diet. They were added after the big mistake that was made. Now, that's going to make a lot of sense to you in just a few moments. This is, that, this is the new stuff I'm talking about. So stay with me as we continue to go on. Now, I showed you this. I love this graph. And as we're talking about nutrition, I have to show it again because I love the fact that it's this little, this little adage that genetics loads the gun, but lifestyle pulls the trigger. So in other words, there's something called epigenetics. We understand genetics. There's epigenetics. Now, epi meaning above. So in other words, your genes will behave based on what they're exposed to or what you are consuming as your diet or your food or even your lifestyle, really, all the things that you do. Your genes will express themselves based on how you eat, right? And we know this to be true because they've done these twin um, studies where they take two twins, right? Um, or a set of twins, and one they put on a high-fat diet, you know, with lots of protein from a meat source. The other they put on a plant-based diet, and they had them eat that way for a certain period of time in a controlled setting, and then they look at how their bodies have responded to the diets. And even though the twins are basically genetically identical, the one that's eating the diet that's high in fat and grease and protein from a meat source ends up having many of the lifestyle issues, whereas the other doesn't have those same issues, right? So here was an example of how epigenetics works. So in other words, when the person who was eating a high fat diet with lots of protein from a meat source they turned on conditions that were basically dormant in the cell, but then they switched on like a light switch. And that's something that T. Colin Campbell, who wrote the China study, that he discovered in that very landmark study that was done in China after the name of his book, China Study, right? He does this huge study, some 800 million Chinese. It's a very large study. And in this study, they found that when casein, which is uh, a protein that is derived from dairy products, when it's introduced into the diet, it turns cancer on like a light switch. You take it out of the diet, it turns cancer off. So this is, again, an example of epigenetics. Your body expressing itself based on what you are giving it, right? So this helps us to understand that first of all, your genes are not your fate. You can actually choose your way into bad health. 
You can choose your way down the path of sickness. But again, this seminar is to take you from sickness to health. So it's good to understand that whatever your genes have done or been doing, you can reverse it by taking that same thing that I'm talking about today out of your diet, those same type of dietary um, choices out of your diet. So genetics only loads the gun, it's what you do that will pull the trigger. So mama, daddy, grandma, grandpa, they could have had diabetes, they could have had heart disease, they could have had a lot of things. So if you eat like they ate, then you'll probably get them too. 75% of what takes place to us in our health is by our own choice. Is that clear? Very good, very good. I'm gonna skip this video. Uh, when I was on the Oprah show, we had the food disparagement law. Uh, Not sure what happened there, but I changed my mind. I'm, I want you to see this. I'm talk Welcome back for a great segment of Vegetarian Diet May Help You Live Longer. My doctor even told me that. According to a new study of 70,000 participants, however, vegetarians had a 12% lower risk of death compared to those who regularly eat meat. Uh, Dr. David Samadhi is a member of the Fox News Medical A team. He here, he's here to weigh in on this. And what I found interesting about this study is that this benefits men more than it does women. Well, it's, it is very interesting. And everyone knows that the vegetarian diet is much better than red meat. And I know you like red meat, so we'll talk about this. They still don't know why men are metabolizing this a little different than women. But what's interesting is that it's a large scale, 70,000 participants That's published great. in JAMA, coming from Loma Linda, prestigious institution. So this is definitely a great news for, for all the vegetarians and for some that once in a while we have red meat we should try to convert I've been a huge fan of Mediterranean diet it has helped me and I know a lot of people that watch the Sunday house call they love this thing so there's a big message over here but the, the, the exciting part of this is why it does this happen and what they're digging in and finding out that it's all about the gut flora and gut bacteria when you think about the bacteria in the colon, they can change depending on what you eat. So the whole saying is, that, you know, you are who you are and what you eat has to do with the changes that happens in the colon. This particular study found out that if you eat a lot of red meat, you're going to have these bacteria called bacteroides. If you eat a lot of vegetables, you're going to have this privatella. You want to have lower bacteroides and more privatella. So the bacteria can change depending on what you eat. And this is a very, very interesting findings. We also have said that the changes in bacteria in the gut can translate to lower immune system. You can get Crohn's and colitis. It can affect your cardiovascular. Breakdown of those carnitine can clog up and cause heart disease and stroke. So. Um, now we are understanding this better, and there's still a lot more research that can be done. New study. Eat more vegetables. It's a whole different type of gut bacteria. Remember I talked about the microbiome, right? So now, go back. Think about all those diets through the years, right? But going all the way back to the original diet, and science is now finding out when you eat more vegetables, you have a different type of gut bacteria. And here's something that I have found. I've met people who say, well, you know what? I tried that plant-based diet, but oh, man, it was, I just felt a little sick. Something was weird, something was strange. Do you know what that was? It is the transition from Prevotella as a gut bacteria to back or going from bacteroides to Prevotella, going from a meat gut bacteria to a plant-based one. And you basically go through a healing crisis. The body has to transition and when it does it, it doesn't feel good, right? So that's why it's not really a good idea to go back and forth and back and forth. The body ultimately wants to do what it was originally designed to do or consume what it was originally designed to do. Again, I want to make it so clear. This is not a judgment on anybody if you actually have a lot of meat in your diet. That's not the purpose here. I'm sharing information. You'll make a decision based on what makes the most sense to you. And I, all my job to do is, is to hopefully make it make sense so you can make 
smart, intelligent decisions. But whatever you do, whatever your diet is, you know what? That's your business, right? But I'm going to share the information, and hopefully it will translate and make sense to you. So if you've got more meat, you've got a different type of gut bacteria. But that same gut bacteria is the kind that is struggling to help you stay alive all the time because we know that fiber is the thing that fuels the microbiome, right? Talked about that uh, last night as we talked about butyrate is sort of like the, the thank you from your gut bacteria that sends out a signal to the rest of the body, especially to the inflammatory cells saying everything is all right here, everything is okay down here in the gut, don't become inflamed. All right? Now, it was Mark Twain, is reported, who said, all things in moderation, all things in moderation, including moderation. Now, that's not the best definition of temperance. Uh, I like it better to say to uh, avoid the things that are harmful and, you know, to eat those things that are healthy in moderation because we still need to eat in moderation. We still need to be temperate, I should say. Because um, you can take something that's really good and you can overdo it. Did you know that you can actually poison yourself from drinking too much water? You can drink too much water. And water is good, right? Nobody's got a problem with water. Good old pure H2O is good. No one will dispute that. But if you drink too much of it, you can cause yourself some serious problems, right? So you want to actually avoid the things that are harmful and eat that which is good in moderation, right? But how about that? Mmm, pizza, all that cheese. And what are those red things on there? Looks like some type of pepperoni. So what's all in there? You got some, you know, some pretty simple carbohydrates there, right? Uh, with all that bread, and it's got sugar in it. Then you've got all that cheese, and that cheese has no fiber, but it's got a lot of fat in it. It's got a lot of fat in it, right? Because that's just milk fat, right? And then you've got the sausages on That's a protein when it's got all types of sulfates in it and all these additives in it. And yeah, it's a good mixture. But what they did was they looked at, and I'm going to show you this video, they looked at the most addictive foods. There it is right there. I'll be honest with you, I love some pizza myself. Love it. In fact, I had some yesterday. I went over to uh, Whole Foods, and um, they had the vegan pizza. And it was delicious. So you can get healthy versions. You don't have to say, oh, no, I can't eat these things anymore. No, you can get a healthy version of it. In fact, look at all of the pizza places, Blaze Pizza, Mod Pizza, uh, I think you've got another one here called something pizza, help me out, pizza factory or something like that, I don't know. Yeah, there you go. And they all have options for vegan or vegetarian pizza. So you can still enjoy the things that you love, but you just want to make sure you do the right ones. You know, because ultimately what I'm going, I want you to walk away with after this presentation is this concept of eating the things that love you back. Yeah, yeah. Eating or loving the kind of foods that actually love you, that love you first, because they were made and designed to love you. And that's going to sound like a weird concept, but stick with me. So let's take a look at this video. Pizza, cookies, ice cream. These foods reward your brain just like a drug, creating cravings, loss of control, and withdrawal, according to a dietary study. Researchers ranked foods based on their addictive qualities. Of the 35 foods researchers examined, carrots and cucumbers were at the bottom of the list. Pizza was the number one most addictive food. Pizza contains salt and fat in the cheese and carbs like sugar in the crust. This combination of ingredients triggers the amygdala, a set of neurons in the brain that detects the sensory properties of foods. And that's what makes pizza so delicious and gives you a desire to eat more. While there are natural foods high in fat like avocados and foods high in carbs like brown rice, they won't trigger the amygdala in the same way. The combination in pizza is key. Ice cream was also listed as a top five addictive food. It's high in fat and sugar and people can develop a tolerance to the dessert. You guys are like looking like, 
oh yeah, I heard what you said, but boy, that ice cream sure looks good. <laughs> I saw it in your eyes. I said, let me turn this thing off. I think this is working against me. <laughs> but it goes back. It goes back to what, I, what, I, what I'm building on is that what we are seeing and what's being presented to us, no matter where we are in the world, what's being presented to us is something that's outside of what is logical, rational, and best for us in the bigger picture scheme of things. And if we buy into the notion that there is a God who designed our bodies and then actually prepared a meal or a menu for our bodies, when we see the science come out that shows us that food that is a food product, that is processed, it does some tricky things in the brain. It actually causes, causes you to want to eat more so that you can gain more weight, so that you can come down with lifestyle diseases. Whereas the thing that was in the beginning, the fruits, the nuts, the grains, the seeds, those things instead, they don't put weight on you, right? They don't cause you to want to eat more. When you, you can eat more of them and not gain weight and you can feel full if you have a nice big salad and you have some grains like brown rice or something like that. These things are much better and they point in two different directions. One designed to make you healthy and one designed to make you sick. But we want to go from sickness to health. Now, why am I showing you a picture of a bat? That is a horrid, horrid looking thing, isn't it? I saw this. This was right when COVID-19 kicked off and everybody was pointing fingers. Where did it come from? Well, you know, you've heard about the wet markets. The wet markets in China, they have wet markets. They call them that because they have all manner of food items there that they eat, including, are you ready for this? Do you have a weak stomach? Do you have a weak stomach? Bats, rats, snakes, cats, dogs, right? They eat all these things. But I grabbed a hold of this study because they were pointing the finger to the wet markets in Wuhan, China as the culprit which kicked off COVID-19. Every time we have some type of viral infection that becomes pandemic, it has always come from an animal. Whether, that, whether that's swine flu, whether that's avian flu, whatever the flu, uh, or even when we were going through that, that period of time with mad cow disease, it's always what we eat. Are you listening to me? That's why I'm covering it in our nutrition section because at the end of the day, go back to the original to understand the purposes. What is, what is the reason, what is the basis for the diet that was given? Can you believe, are you ready? Hold on to your seats. Can you believe in the book? This is a Bible book. It's called Leviticus. It's in the early part. And God told Israel, don't eat snakes and don't eat bats. Now, didn't give an explanation. He said, these things are unclean to you. So he says, don't eat them. But then when we decide, hey, you know what? I know better. I think I'm going to make a little bat soup. And I'm going to enjoy it with some biscuits and some muffins and some rice. Well, guess what? We end up with a pandemic that's global. And this particular, this was a an article from The Lancet, a very reputable uh, medical journal, and they looked and they saw, they saw coronavirus may have started in bats. Why? Because they took samples, blood samples, from those who had come down with COVID-19, and what they found was the same genes or the genome structure inside the human that's found in the bat. I share this with you because, again, I want you to go back with me to the original and begin to see that there was love in that diet. I said there was love in the diet. Now, watch this. <clears throat> now, you need to know that 
I think last night I mentioned how if you, un, if you were to unravel the DNA, that's the double helix you see there, that's what you know, your body's made up of. And it's really a powerful thought. And if you're thinking about nutrition, you should think about this. Here's what I'm trying to do for the next few minutes before we bring this to a close. I'm, I'm desiring you, I'm wanting you to think different about what you eat. I want you to think about everything that you eat is either repairing, breaking down, or causing some mutation to your DNA. Are you listening to me? And just, I wanted to break down what your DNA is. DNA is very simple, right? This was discovered in the 1950s by these two scientists, and basically they, just, they cracked the code. And here we are, we understand now the double helix, the breakdown of the DNA, or the DNA of the human body, packed inside these cells, and yet they are amazing, because we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Now, you see the outside part of the DNA structure. It's like a ladder, right? So if you look at the outside of the ladder, that, those are made up of your polysaccharides. Poly what? Polysaccharides, that just means many sugars, right? So that's what it's made of, polysaccharides. But then the rungs as you go in the ladder, those are made up of proteins or amino acids. Now what holds the rung to the outside part of it? Guess what it is? Minerals. They're minerals, right? So that's basically the basic, basic, basics of DNA. And I'm telling you this for a reason. Now, many people believe that they need more protein. But when you examine the disease and the breakdown of DNA in people, it's not because they weren't getting enough protein. It's because there's damage between the outer part of the double helix and the rungs in the ladder. So therefore, there's not enough minerals in the diet. So there's a breakdown. I mean, there are lots of ways that there can be mutations, but the very basic is that there's not enough minerals in the diet, which you would get from, guess what? Green leafy vegetables. Oh boy, I tell you, there's love in them, they're vegetables. This guy, his name is William Lee. Dr. William Lee, he's a great, he's an MD, great researcher. He wrote a book, I think I mentioned it, it's called Eat to Beat Disease. It's a great book. I always recommend a book when I come here. I used to recommend for quite a uh, few years, uh, How Not to Die by Dr. Michael Greger. I quote him often, often. But Dr. William Lee, he has written this book, Eat to to beat disease. It's one of the most amazing books I've read on nutrition. Because I first learned about Dr. William Lee as a researcher when he presented on a TED Talk. And this was a great TED Talk. It's still up and it's got millions of views. So it really, really uh, pops up there with the algorithm to showing you that this is a top-notch lecture on TED Talk. But he basically gave a talk on angiogenesis. You see that is the first one up there, and I'll explain that in just a moment. Well, they're coming up with all these kind of drugs to, to, to fight cancer with, um, with anti-angiogenic drugs. And he was talking about the different research that they were doing, but then he had an epiphany. He actually found out as they were doing the research, he discovered that with all these drugs, that they were trying to examine, broccoli and collards fought cancer and were more anti-angiogenic than any drug they had come up with. And he basically said that to the researcher. She came out, you know, usually a person gets on TED Talk and they stand up and they talk for 18 minutes or so or less, and then they finish, they say thank you, and they walk off. But when he said thank you, the, the, I guess one of the organizers came out and said, wow, this is fascinating, tell us more. And he says, well, you know, he was starting to talk about the fruits and vegetables, and she says, no, tell us about the drugs. And I thought about that. I said, why does she do that? Because he said emphatically at the end, he says, if you really want something that's anti-angiogenic, he says, here they are. And he pointed to fruits and vegetables. He went back to the garden, the same place that I went to for the original diet. Isn't that something? 
Now, let me explain what angiogenesis is very quickly. Angiogenesis is a, natural, a naturally occurring process in the body that when there is an organ that is developing in the body, it must develop blood vessels. That means it needs to receive nutrition to that organ for, in order for it to grow. The moment a uh, liver starts to grow in a, a human fetus, then it's the angiogenesis process starts to start to feed that, that liver or that kidney or, what it, or the pancreas in order for it to grow. In fact, even beyond your, the, your, the, when you're a fetus in your mother's womb, every time there's some cut or scrape or a laceration, angiogenesis kicks in. Here is the problem. When a person is eating the wrong foods causing damage to the DNA, there's something that happens. You start to grow a tumor, a cyst, a fibroid, one of, one of those kind of growths in the body. And sometimes it starts out as just a little small thing that's the size of the head of a pen. And then before you know it, that thing is the size of a golf ball or the size of a grapefruit and is growing in your body. How did it get so big? And the reason why it grows is because of angiogenesis. See, in other words, the human body under the law, it says something's growing, it's time to feed it. You have to feed it so then it grows. It doesn't distinguish between a liver or a, uh, uh, um, the pancreas or kidneys. It just knows that it must follow the law, so it causes it to grow. Unfortunately, the thing that's growing will grow so large that it takes over the host and actually kills a person. And that's what happens with cancer. You understand that? Does that make sense? Well, you're going to love this. Let me give you some encouragement. When a person eats collard greens and broccoli, those vegetables are anti-angiogenic. In other words, they cut off the blood supply to something that's growing like a tumor, while not cutting off the blood supply to important organs in the body. Wait a minute. You mean it distinguishes between that which is harmful to the body and that which is un- Oh, that's harmful for the body and that which is healthy for the body and necessary for the body? You mean it is able to distinguish between that tumor is not needed, starve it? Absolutely. Now, I want to know, what do you hear in that? I hear love. Can you believe it? That there is a food item that will go in and fight for you, protect you? Yes. Dr. William Lee, he gives five defense systems for health. Angiogenesis, regeneration, immunity, microbiome, and DNA protection. He gives those five things as the things that we need in our diet and in our bodies to help us to fight. Number one, angiogenesis. Regeneration is clear. Regeneration is basically stem cells, right? It's when you get a scrape on your arm or if you lose a chunk I know how horrible that sounds, but if it happens on your elbow, the stem cells, which have not decided what kind of part of your body it's going to be, it rushes to that area, and then at that point, it decides, okay, we're going to be an elbow, the little skin that's on the elbow. It's amazing. Your body does that naturally. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to do anything about it, but guess what helps it do it? Certain foods. Vegetables. Fruit. The things that were in the beginning, do you hear love in that? I'm telling you, the things that were made were made and designed to love you, to heal you, to help you, to protect you. In fact, immunity, we get that. We know that there are certain foods that if you eat them, they actually strengthen your immune system, right? There's just certain things that do that. Microbiome, we talked about that. DNA protection, there are foods that you can eat that actually protect your DNA. Let me give you a few of them. Key foods affecting regeneration, stem cell boosting. Look at that. Apples, apricots, blackberries, capers, carrots, celery, chestnuts, cranberries. Look at that. It's the list is just, and all of them are vegetables. This is that point. Either you're going to go buy the book, because you'll find them in the book, or you can take out your 
smartphone, you can take a picture of that, and then you can start saying, you know what? I want to eat foods that regenerate, that help to build up my body and not tear it down, right? I'll wait while you take a picture. But while you're taking the picture, I want you to keep in mind, you're hearing love in that. You know what I decided as I was going through this? It hit me like a ton of bricks. I said, you know what? If this food loves this much, meaning when I eat it, if it loves me that much, where it protects me, where it heals me, where it regenerates, where it is, becomes my immune function, and I just, all I'm called to do is just get them in. I said, wow, if it does that, if I'm seeing love in it, it must have come from a loving designer, a loving God. I don't know what you conclude, but that's what I concluded. And if those things were given in the beginning, because before God even made a man, he made a diet. <laughs> Did you know that? Before he made a man, he set a menu. He says, this shall be your food from this menu. Eat from this menu. Oh, yeah, yeah, there, there's chicken out there. There's, there's fish in the water, and there's, there's cows and all that stuff. But here is your diet plan, because what I've done is I put inside these foods things that will love you, protect you, heal you. Mm. Okay, you get that? Here, look at this. Foods that are naturally prebiotic. See, uh, uh, I got a text today or something about probiotics, but we need foods that are prebiotic. Prebiotic foods are fibrous foods, foods that are rich in fiber, right? So what you see here are foods that affect the microbiome because they're prebiotic. See, pre means before you get sick before there's a problem. Probiotic means fix the problem that you already have. Antibiotic means against killing something that's already causing you a problem in your system. But so what God gave is a diet that's prebiotic, and they're all full of fiber, and nothing's better as a prebiotic than onions and garlic. Does that make sense to you? Okay, we're wrapping this up. There's some other foods there that are, that are excellent as prebiotics for the system. Take a picture of it. I recommend you get the book, though. It's a great read. You'll be a different person on the other side of reading it. Okay, wrapping it up. Just going to give you a few last little tips, then Mark's going to come back up and give you instructions about what's next. And I can tell you this, it's a lot more. If you like this, I'm just here for the five days. And all I'm doing is taking 50 minutes to an hour tops and sharing with you these things in a rapid fire, principle-based kind of format. But think about 10 weeks of being able to sit down, ask questions, take notes, sample foods, form a support group. All of these are available to you. And for those of you who are sitting here, I am going to challenge you. If you have been blessed by what you've heard, A, sign up for the program. B, tell somebody else to sign up for the program. Because how many of you know somebody who's diabetic? I know you do. How many of you know somebody who has cardiovascular disease, has high blood pressure, has arthritis? You would be remiss. If you walked out of here and said, you know what? And some of you have come up either to Mark or to, to, to Mr. Timon, and you've said, I really like the information I'm hearing. Well, if you like the information you're hearing, don't you think that somebody else would? Don't you? Or am I talking to myself? Of course. So I'm going to challenge you. Tell somebody. Let's wrap this up. So we looked at the original diet. There are three diets, basically, that you find. And when I presented in New York at the Plant-Based Summit, I showed that there are three diets that you find in the Bible. It's the original diet, the restoration diet, and the emergency diet. The original diet was the fruit, nuts, grains, and seeds, right? Genesis 1, 29. But the restoration diet, as I mentioned, after something really bad happened, as we like to say in theological circles, that there was sin that came into the world. And then God added greens to the diet. 
Now, think about that. See how the love continues? Now, I'm going to show you something about greens. I've already said that they fight cancer. Before that, we like to think that Adam and Eve lived in a perfect world, and there would be no cancer, there would be no disease. But now that sin has come in, disease is going to come in, so God adds something to the diet to fight cancer. Do you hear the love in that? I hope you do. Because I see the love in that. So he says, I've given you nuts and seeds. Look at this. Here's some things. Use your technology. Take pictures of these things. Go and study it for yourself and even make it a part of your diet. Notice nuts and seeds. One handful, about a quarter cup of nuts extends your life by two years. That's powerful when you think about it. See, the food that God gives, it extends your life. The food that we share or we choose rather from a box or can or bag, it tends to shorten our lives. Certainly we know that meat, meat shortens our lives, but the original diet was fruits, nuts, grains, and seeds. It extends your life by one year. Take Brazil nuts full of selenium. I'm going to talk about those in just a minute as it relates to cholesterol. Almonds are high in protein. It's a good protein. It's a healthy protein, but you only want to eat about a handful, no more than that. Holidays are coming. It's a handful with your hands closed, fist, nothing piled up in the hand. Turn the fist over. Anything falls out, you don't eat it, right? Walnuts, good brain food, high in omegas, right? It's the king of nuts as it pertains to having good brain function. As I mentioned, I eat still cut oatmeal every day. I put walnuts in it because it's good for your brain. Don't let your brain shrivel up and die. Eat walnuts. Add some berries to it if you like, and you should, because they're good. But let me talk about Brazil nuts real quick. Brazil nuts, they did a study. There's a science there. If you want it, I will give it to you, share it with you. But for people who have high cholesterol, you usually put on a statin drug. But they did in this study, or what they did in this study, they took four Brazil nuts. It lowered LDL, bad cholesterol, by 20 points in just nine hours. There is no statin drug that has ever been able to do that. Ever. Fearfully, wonderfully made, but also a diet that fits your wonderful body. And the number stayed down even for one whole month. How about that? That's in the original diet. Flax seeds, tablespoon of ground flax seeds. Notice what it, notice what it does. Lowers blood two to three times better than the leading blood pressure medication. And I already told you about sleep. One hour of sleep added to your sleep regimen, and it brings down or reduces your risk of hypertension by 30%. Why don't you do that and do a little flax seeds on your steel-cut oats or your rolled oats. Reduces inflammation in the body, reduces risk of breast and prostate cancer. Hello, why not fight? Show me, please. I want you to do it. I will accept the challenges anybody has a meat, chicken, fish, beef that you can show me that actually reduces your risk of breast cancer or prostate cancer. Now, I'm not putting down your meat, you understand. I'm just talking about the science because we're here to talk about going from sickness to health. I can show you the studies on nuts and seeds and grains and fruits and vegetables that do these things, but there is no science on any meat product actually fighting disease. Doesn't exist. Oh, and by the way, just a throwback from last night, it cures constipation, flax seeds. Add some berries. Berries are excellent to have in your diet. Why? It's a good brain food. In fact, the science shows that berries are the healthiest fruit. Harvard studies show that one serving of blueberries, two servings of strawberries, slows brain aging by two and a half years. Now, do you think that that just happened, that one day it evolved, that one day blueberries and strawberries said, you know what, let's have some chemical properties within ourselves that actually slow the brain aging. They've been that way from the beginning because the one who made them in the beginning knew that one day that our brains would start aging and we would need something to counteract it. Do you hear the love in that? Then if there's love in them berries, there must be a loving designer that we should know. By the way, it reduces heart and stroke risk. 
heart attack and stroke risk. Now, I'm going to close with greens. Willie, I'm going to talk about greens. Willie is a guy who's been, I've gotten to know here um, in Tacoma, and he has, um, he's got a nice little garden, and yesterday he shared his greens with us, and they were delicious. Notice what the what this study says. It says the Global Burden of Disease study identified the typical American diet as the primary cause of Americans' death and disease. And it goes on to say inadequate intake of vegetables in our, is our fifth leading dietary risk factor, nearly as bad as consumption of processed meats. And we know from the World Health Organization that processed meats, salami, bologna, ham, all of those, even turkey, if you're clean meats, they actually are a class one carcinogen, which has been linked to cancer. So by not eating vegetables, it is the fifth leading dietary risk factor, nearly as bad as eating those things that are carcinogenic. Do you understand that? So not eating vegetables is killing you. More than 100,000 lives per year could be saved if people just increased their consumption of fruits and vegetables. If people just went back to the foods that love. I'm going to put it to you that way. In a Harvard University study, researchers found that of all the foods associated with or associated with um, protection against chronic diseases, this greens pack the greatest punch. I'm not sure why I can't get that out of my mouth. But Greens pack the greatest punch. Let me just give you some in closing. Watch the love in this. Broccoli reduces cancer risk. University of Chicago, Harvard University, and the U.S. Institutes of Health. It was a multi-study done by these prestigious universities and institutions. And notice, non-Hopkins lymphoma reduced by 40% by eating broccoli. Lung cancer reduced 28%. Breast cancer by 17%, ovarian cancer by 33%, esophageal cancer by 31%, prostate cancer reduced by 59%, and melanoma, that's skin cancer, by 28%. Men, brothers, 59% reduction in the risk of prostate cancer, which is very common just because you eat broccoli. Now, Point to me the meat that does that. Show me the love in a steak that does that. You won't find it. Now, I know what you're thinking. Some of you are thinking this. Well, if I eat my steak with some broccoli, then doesn't it balance out? No. You counteract the effects of the broccoli. Now, if you're going to do it, you probably want to eat a lot of broccoli with that steak. Get the broccoli, though. There are other things that you can do. Now, notice this. Cruciferous vegetables. Now, cruciferous vegetables, that's your broccoli, that's your kale. They're all cruciferous. By the way, does anyone know what cruciferous means? The, these, these are the vegetables that were introduced and brought along after that bad mistake in the garden, sin. Does anyone know what cruciferous means? Oh, boy, you're going to love this. The very vegetable that was brought in after there was sin is called cruciferous, and it means cross-bearing. One that bears the cross. Now, from a botanical standpoint, observing the way that that vegetable grows, it grows in the form of a cross. That's why you hear the word crucify in cruciferous. But most people don't know that that name came as a result of its characteristics, but also because, or they named it cruciferous, if you break the word down, you see it's cross-bearing, right? Cru, cross Fur, rust, is bearing. But here's the thing. When you go back to the beginning and you see that sin had caused cancer, you now have a vegetable 
that heals your disease in the way that the cross heals your sin. Institute of Food Research in Newark. They saw that the effects of cancer cells when exposed to the bioactive sulforaphane, you find that in broccoli and kale and those green vegetables, showed profound epigenetic changes in the DNA. Remember we talked about epigenetics? So if you're starting to have some damage, you're starting to have some problems, eat the broccoli, eat the kale, eat the collards. That's why I call the presentation Collards and Kale the Love Story. It's not that they're in love with each other, but they're in love with you because the loving designer made them for you, to help you, to heal you. Finally, another study showed that epigenetic increase in the activity of tumor suppressor genes. In other words, as the genes, this is what I basically explained to you about it, anti-angiogenesis. When you eat cruciferous vegetables, it suppresses the cancer genes themselves. This is what the science shows. Wow. I don't know about you, but I find this to be amazing. See, our bodies are built up from the food we eat. It is a wonderful process that transforms the, the food we eat into blood and uses this blood to build up the body. That's from a wonderful book called Ministry of Healing. I know that Mark will talk about some of these things. Does this all make sense to you? Here's my hope as I bring up Mark. Come on, Mark. Here's my hope. Took a little extra time. I hope you don't mind today. If we're not as late today, the sun is still out. You can still do some things. And Mark's going to still give away a few things and give you some instruction. But here's my hope. We've gone five days, and I want to thank you first and foremost for being here. I like to kind of blow it out on the final day and really bring to you or bring it home what, the, what really matters. And what really matters here is that Yes, I can tell you about nutrition, and I've done it for the last few years. And here's something that I've learned. As I tell people about nutrition, tell them about having a, a healthier microbiome, tell people about getting better rest and having a healthier heart. And I tell people, and I tell people, and I tell people, and I come back year after year, and people are listening to the same thing, and they basically just have a lot of information. But when I saw this, I felt the conviction to tell you that there's something different about this diet. There's something different about this lifestyle. And it's something that should go to your heart. It should speak to your heart. It should show you that there is love in this food. And if you have seen the love in the food that I've just shared, here's my prayer for you. Get to know the one who designed them, if you don't already. I thank you. May God bless you. Mark.